Well, good morning. Special welcome. Any guests who are joining us here this morning? I had uh, such a blessed Easter week last week. I was so encouraged in the truth and the reality of God sending His Son into the world to die for our sins, be buried, and be raised for my justification. And so, uh, just a treasure. Thank you all for everything you did and being a part of that week. This morning, we are going to go back to the book of Romans. We've been studying through this for a while now. Uh, we pulled out uh, for the last month to focus specifically on the pandemic, pandemic that we're currently living. I just wanted to find comfort and focus and hope from the scriptures. And it was just, uh, just a good season in the word of God. And I've prayed and I've just sought God's leading. If it was time to, to go back into Romans as it's such a powerful sin manifesting section is what we're currently in. It's, it's a tough section. The last month we looked at Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. Isaiah 41.10, what a comfort and stronghold God is. We looked at the gospel in 2 Samuel. We, Easter, we, we looked at the victory of death that we have. And so we, we needed those encouragements uh, we've had many friends and guests joining our live stream, and I just want you to hear this really clear this morning. <clears throat> I remember when 9-11 hit this country, and people flooded into churches because we were afraid. There, there was a new enemy that had finally come right into our own country, and, it, and we felt so vulnerable, and people were scared, and it lasted for about a month. <laughs> and all the numbers just went back to normal at the churches, and many went on with their lives again and said, shoo, I'm glad that's over. And it went from fear to frustration now with TSA when you fly. I don't want that to happen again. While we have a virus that cannot be seen and not fully understood, but an enemy that has brought the fear of death to us and we, we suppress it. We don't want to deal with death and God's making us think about it and deal with it in a whole new way. I'm living at gravesides. It's made us uneasy. And people are talking about God more than, than, than ever <laughs> in the last few months. I just heard that Walmart's out of Bibles. <laughs> they got to get more. That's beautiful. I love that. So I want you to listen real close to what I'm about to say, because this is so important your, your whole eternity depends on it. You don't need help to just get through a season. You can't just use God like a genie and you, you rub the lamp and say, give me COVID-19 help and then get back to life. I want you to hear the words of Jesus to a religious man, a very religious man who was genu genuinely interested in being saved. He came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, unless you're born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You need to be saved. You need to be made new and born again, a new creation. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to bring you into the realm of salvation. And Jesus looked at this man and told him that unless you're born and to this kingdom that I've come, you're, you're just going to die and perish. Powerful words from Jesus Christ. And that be begs a really, really important question. Save from what? A virus? Jesus came to save us from God because of our sin. Sin entered the world when Adam ate of that tree. And it plunged the whole human race into sin and death, which brought separation from God. And this is why we have a virus. This is why there's death, crime, and hatred. Because we fell and we were separated from God, what we were made for. Sin made us wholly devoted now to ourselves at any cost. We're just locked into self. We're turned inward. God has said the soul that sins must die. So God has made a way of salvation. That's the good news of history. Our creator is merciful and gracious. 
And he's made a way to save us, to bring us back to himself, to have fellowship with him, to dwell as his children. But the message of God is that you need to know what you're being saved from. Or the gospel is going to be cheap to you. You'll you'll just use God. You'll, You'll try to do nice things so God blesses you. And you'll just always be using him. You'll just be religious. And Jesus looked at the religious man and said, unless you're born again, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. So we don't need more religious people. A superficial analysis of your true problem will bring a superficial help from it and a superficial love for God. You will never treasure the remedy that God has given in his son, that you will love Jesus in such a way that you'll give up your life to serve him. Without that, you're only going to be religious. And you're just going to bring God into your plans You're going to thank him for your good things. Get mad at him when he doesn't act the way you want him to. You're just going to always keep this God at a distance with your religion. The gospel is that you are 10,000 leagues under the sea and you can do nothing to save yourself. God reached in and he pulled you out and he resuscitated you and he gave you life and he saved you from your imminent death. But if I'm just swimming in a little kid's pool, maybe the big pool where it's three feet deep, and I'm swimming and I feel like I'm going to drown. And I I finally realize I won't drown because all I got to do is put my feet on the ground. And when you know that, you're never going to appreciate the guy who jumped in to save you in the baby pool or the three foot water. Why are you giving me mouth to mouth? Get away from me. That's gross. What's your problem? And so until you finally realize that you are 10,000 leagues under the sea and a little religion can't fix you or help you, you'll never appreciate this gospel. There's just a big difference. And the difference is whether you use God in this season and go back to normal like we did with 9-11 Once the fear is gone, I'll just go back to living any way I want. Whether you are born again, and now you love Jesus Christ with a love that will only grow over time. You have to understand your condition. What you need to be saved from to ever receive God's remedy in Jesus Christ. And truly be saved and made new of what his gospel promises. He can make you new, whether you are a a drunkard, immoral, whatever it is, just religious, God can make you new. This gospel is a power of God. And that is why your religion is just so up and down with just spurts, because it's not a salvation. And so I'm asking you to not let this time pass without its intended purpose that you would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ from this condition and be saved. That you won't quit defining God and telling him how he has to be and what is fair and what isn't. That's got to die in this season. My prayer is that this morning you would look this in the face and deal with it. And I want you to come labor with me in the book of Romans. And and Paul's going to give us a true diagnosis, God's diagnosis about your condition by the one who made you and the one whom you will stand on the last day and give an account for your life. And what did you do with his son when he sent him in the world to save you? To warn you. Not with fancy stories or make you emotional. Something to just comfort you falsely. Peace, peace when there is no peace. I don't want that. I don't want fog machines and lights turned down low and no just talking about stress and practical things. We got to wrestle in his word to understand it so that you can embrace it by faith. And so what I'm asking this morning is everything within you wants to turn this off and not deal with it. And I want you to come journey with me and come wrestle. This is eternity. Don't go to superficial help. Let's go to God with a true diagnosis and get the true remedy that can really truly help you. So let's go to our God 
and pray as we take up Romans chapter 2. Father, I come before you, and that is my fear. God, I don't want to go back to normal. I'm tired of hearing that. Normal was a bunch of Americans living the American dream on a boat that was going down and to destruction. God, don't let us go back to normal. Let you become what you should be, God. To be from you, through you, to you, all things be for your glory. God, that you would be praised and honored and loved and treasured and served. That you would be the center of this world. God, I pray that you will work in our hearts now as we go and delve into Romans 2. God, come meet us. We need you. We're coming to you for help. We look to you alone, and I pray, come meet us. And I pray for your saints. God, I love these dear ones. God, use this in their hearts this morning. And for those who want to turn this off right now, God, by your Spirit, hold them into truth. Let them just say, I need someone to tell me the truth. I don't need lies and I don't need false peace. I need the truth of God. God, would you meet that heart? This morning, I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Turn with me to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, the last time we were together, <laughs> feels like 10 years ago to me. <laughs> this has been a long time. We finished up chapter 1, and, and it has. It's, I think that calls for a long review. I know how much my brother Jacques loves long reviews, so he's here to encourage me in this. All right, so we're going to open up our study this morning in chapter 2. And chapter 2, this is a powerful chapter. It's going to get a little hotter in the kitchen than Romans chapter 1. It's so powerful for those who are moral and religious. These are the ones who are condemning the sin in our world without having condemned our own hearts. We're just little finger pointers at everyone else. And Paul's going to take it and just say, boom. Let's look at our own hearts this morning. There's, these are the ones that most unbelievers point to and say, I don't want your Christianity because of hypocrites. Paul doesn't want it either. Christ didn't want it either. So maybe if you don't like things about the church, you're going to like this morning because I'm going to tell you what I don't like about it. God's going to tell you what he doesn't like about it. He hates hypocrisy. And this morning, we want to let the Word of God come in and start dealing with it. God pointed his finger, said the same thing. Not in my family. <laughs> Not in my family, says God. Paul's going to turn to the Jews now in chapter 2. And these are the people who were very religious. They had the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and all, all those standards of trying to be righteous and please God and all of their worship in the temple and all of these things. And so if I could say anything, this is the church today. This is the, those who are moral and want to live according to God's word. That's who we're going to go after now in Romans chapter 2, that Paul's not ashamed of this gospel. We looked at chapter 1. And if you'll look with me again, it ended in verse 32. He listed all the sins of this world. <laughs> he said, but what they do... They practice these things that are worthy of death, and they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. In Romans 1, they just, they applaud each other. They have gay parades, and they celebrate their iniquities, and they boast of all their conquerings of sin and what they do. They're proud of it. Now chapter 2 comes to a different kind of people. They condemn it. They don't applaud sin. They condemn it and they point it out and show you in the word of God, that's wrong. That's sin. That's against God. That's not right. And they judge those who live that way. But there's a problem. They're doing the same things in their heart or outwardly. And so they're, they're just dealing with everybody else. Here's God's word. Here's what it says to you. And they never just stop and say, what does it say to me? I just tell you out of this gate, Christ said it's not the healthy who need a physician. It's those who are, it's not, it's the sick. 
I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. That was the gospel. Jesus is the friend of sinners. I want to be a church that's the friend of sinners. We love them with the truth and we point them to a savior. This chapter is just so powerful. Chapter one, there's this general revelation. The truth of God is revealed in creation. And it tells you there's a God. When you look at the perfection of creation, it's just there's a transcendence that says God, creator. It tells you. And this general revelation was suppressed. I don't want to deal with God. I want my unrighteousness. I want to live any way I want. I'm not going to have God. And they they did all these sins of immorality, homosexuality, selfishness, greed, malice, deceit, gossips, haters of God, disobedient to their parents. God just gives them over. And, And this wrath that God puts on them is, you don't want me? Go ahead, have your sin. This is a day in America. Here it is. Go live any way you want. Now in chapter two, God has given a special revelation. Chapter one is his creation. Chapter two is the inspired word of God that reveals God to us. Here's my Bible. Here's the word of God. And they took that and suppressed it. I don't want to deal with God. And they didn't do it by unrighteousness. They suppressed this truth with self-righteousness. Look at me. I'm a good guy. This isn't about me. This is about you and your problems. So they take the word of God and they suppress it by pointing at everybody else. Both cases. Paul says you're condemned. Immoral or moral. You're both suppressing the truth that I've given to you and not coming to God. Those who were blessed with special revelation in this chapter receive the greater condemnation. The more light that you reject, the greater condemnation. He said it'll be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah, which was an awful city and all their sin that were burned and destroyed, than for Tyre and Sidon, which were religious, where Christ proclaimed the truth and they rejected it. It's going to be worse off for those who had this special revelation and suppressed Christ and didn't deal with them. It's a dangerous thing to have the word of God and not deal with your heart and your life and your soul. The more light rejected, the greater the punishment will be on the great day of judgment that we'll look at next week in Romans 2, when all men are going to appear before the judgment seat of God. As I was thinking And praying upon this chapter and how to introduce it, I came across an old book and an example that I heard a couple weeks ago. And I just wanted to begin with that. In the 70s, 1970, there was a famous book. It was a top seller for like two years. And the title was, I'm okay and you're okay. And this thought was gobbled up by society and it was really comforting, but it wasn't healing because it's the opposite of what God is going to say here in the book of Romans. And then there was a critique of the book later by another book that said, I am dysfunctional and you're dysfunctional. <laughs> so you were all dysfunctional. And look at the world. This guy says, we're all broken. Not everybody's okay. Everybody's broken and messed up. We're just, what, what came out of that book is just narcissism. You know, instead, it's just narcissistic to say we're all okay. We're all dysfunctional. And then 10 years later, another book came out and it it said this, uh, I'm okay, but the rest of you are not okay. So we're going to journey now. I'm not, I'm not okay, but, but you guys are, are, I'm sorry, I'm okay, but the rest of you are not okay. This is messing with me this early. That didn't work either because that's the thinking of Adolf Hitler, the superiority and the dangerous mindset that I'm better than you. And so that book did not work. It did not help society. And then came masochism. I'm not okay, but everyone else is okay. (laughs) I'm messed up, but everybody else is okay. I'm the only one broken in this world. And that didn't help. All the world's ideals and ideas on humanity, they could never fix the problem. And there was a great theologian named John Gerstner in the 1970s. He was a great minister. And he wrote a book and he asked the question, what does the Bible say 
about I'm okay and you are okay. And in the book, (laughs) he tells a story to help us where he figured this out. He and his wife took a trip to Asia in Kashmir. And they were out on an excursion one day on a little boat. And it was he and his wife and his grandson and a boatman. And he said the boatman knew very little English. And on the way back to the shore, that boat bumped into another boat. And he said, we all got wet and, and the boatman got very, very agitated. And Gerstner said to him, we're okay. <laughs> Don't get upset. We're, we're all right. He said, but the man just kept getting more agitated and more stirred up. And Gerstner just kept saying, don't worry, we're okay. It's all right. And as they came to the dock, the man, the the boatman finally just yelled, you are not okay and I am not okay. And his grandson, Gerstner, jumped out and they got out. And right as they did, the whole boat submerged underwater. And he found out that when they hit the other boat, there was a huge hole in his boat that Gerstner had not seen. And if they had stayed in that boat any longer, they would have gone down and they would have drowned. (coughs) Gerstner said, I realize that that is the message of the Bible. I'm not okay, and you're not okay. We're all lost and desperate sinners because of the fall. We're all separated from the glory of God, and we're under his wrath, said Jesus in John 3. Whether you're moral or immoral, religious or irreligious, Jew or Gentile, all of us are not okay. No one has the right to look down on anyone else. We're all in big trouble. We're all alienated from God and we're all suppressing him, whether by his general revelation or his special revelation. And so I'm not okay and you're not okay. And if you don't see yourself in that truth about your condition, you're going to go down in something far worse than water. It'll be the fires of God's wrath And his word tells us that on on every page. You can't can't say, I don't like that. You got to deal with God's remedy. So journey with me, please, in this chapter. Because in my experience as a pastor, I've seen many people go from Romans 1, where they're suppressing the creation and who God is and all of their unrighteousness. And all of a sudden they realize there's a God and now they, take the, the, they start going to church and they, they buy a Bible and now they're trying to do all these good things to please God. And they, they become just judging everybody and they spend the rest of their lives in churches just pointing out, you know, the world is now their enemy instead of their mission field. And I'm just here, all I'm here to do is judge everyone else and point my finger. And they, they just stay in Romans 2. So the heart, my heart, is to, take anyone who's come to Rome. I had someone just say, I I believed in evolution and now I know that God's a creator and he he just sits around judging everybody in Romans 2. (laughs) What good did it do? It doesn't matter if you're in Romans 1 or 2, you're in the boat that's going down. And so my heart and prayer is that everyone would never stay in Romans 2, but we'd get to Romans 3 where there's a gospel to deliver and to save us. Let's pray. I want to pray again. God, I want any boat that's going down, whether Romans 1 or Romans 2, God, whether they're just right now just hate you, suppress you, try to get you out of their thoughts so they can live any way they want. God, I pray this morning this gospel brings salvation. I pray for those who are in the church and all they know is rules and pointing fingers, and they're just mean. God, I want their salvation this morning. We're in a quarantine where we are having to look at our own hearts in a way that we don't usually slow down and look at them. God, I pray by your Spirit that you will now do what only you can do. Go to each heart for what they need and make sure that everyone in this church and everyone listening lands in Romans 3 where Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among who I am foremost. Oh God, do your work, I pray. Amen. Romans 1.32, they give hearty approval to those who practice this sin. 
Now we're going to look at Romans 2, 1 through 3. <clears throat> this is about passing judgment on those in chapter 1. So we look at everyone in chapter 1 and we just judge them and point fingers. It's not, we don't give hearty approval, we give a hearty disapproval. This is the one who knows the ordinances of God. He has the privilege. He has the law. In this chapter, he's zealous for it. He preaches it to others. Don't break the word of God. He teaches it. He tells them that judgment will come upon those who do. They correct the foolish. They're the source of truth in a world that's gone dark. We're the light. We have the light of truth. They don't suppress God. They serve him. They seek to obey him daily and thoroughly. In fact, they even made up more laws of how to obey God on the Sabbath, fired some more rules, and they, they just kept adding to, here's ways to please God. They gather for worship. They offer up sacrifices. They keep holy days and ceremonies. These are the ones who are all about God and his law. They yell out in chapter one, you go, Paul. Preach. This country is so broken. They've exchanged the natural for that which is unnatural. Immorality and the sin and debauchery of this nation, the liberals. This morning, we're going to have a little boomerang effect. You know what a boomerang is? I don't know if the younger guys know. Do you? Okay, Thomas knows what a boomerang is. And it's like this little stick that you throw. And the way it's designed is it goes out and it comes right back at you. This is for free just because everyone's struggling. Do you know what a boomerang is that doesn't come back? A stick. Okay, that was stupid. I'm sorry. This is a boomerang effect. Yeah. Pointing fingers and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, it's coming right back at me. It's coming in power this morning. The Holy Spirit's coming hard after a clear issue in this section and the Holy Spirit's wanting to come after hypocrisy. A sin that just hides so easily and so well. A sin that is exposed and condemned throughout the Holy Scriptures. It's a stench into the nostrils of God. In Matthew 23, Jesus is so gentle and kind with sinners and with the Pharisees and the, these whitewashed tombs. He's telling them, woe are you. You just you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is dirty. And he just, he goes after them so hard and direct. I just want you to see, God hates this. Don't ever make friends with hypocrisy. Don't ever hold it like a friend. I need you to hate this the way God Hates it. This is the one who has great discernment in the word of God and great knowledge. Great ability to sock it to others. Unafraid to confront. Everyone in this chapter usually has the gift of exhortation. I'm a John the Baptist. You brood of vipers. And they miss their own heart. These are the ones who see the ones in Romans 1 as filthy sinners and condemn them. And what is to be, again, their mission field with the truth that God has given them has become their enemies. <laughs> Do you look at the world as your enemies? Like the publican, it said he viewed others with contempt because of his self-righteousness. <laughs> Instead of being debtors, as we saw in Romans 1.14, that I owe a debt now, God save me. When I was going to kill Christians, Paul said, and now I'm a debtor to every kind of society, the Greek, the wise, the foolish, barbarians. I have a debt to tell everyone about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't look at the world to just point fingers and judge it and feel good about myself. I look at the world now as a debtor to tell every one of them about the salvation that's come in Jesus Christ. Is that a good enough introduction, brother? <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's go to our text. Here's our outline this morning. We're going to look at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Your outline is Paul gives you four reasons why self-righteous people are under the judgment of God. The religious, the moral, are under the judgment of God. And we're going to look four reasons. The knowledge of truth, God's justice, hypocritical thinking, and then we're going to close out with the kindness of God. So look with me in verse 1. Therefore, 
Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Romans 1.20, they suppress the truth that's so clear in creation, and God says they are without excuse. On judgment day, you're never going to be able to say, I didn't know there was a God. You're brought into this realm of no excuse. And now in Romans 2, 1, as you have the law of God and you're judging everyone else, he says, you bring yourself into this realm, you're going to have no excuse on the last day. Romans 3, 19, he says, the law is that you, you have no excuse and you're accountable to God. The Greek word for excuse is anapologetos, which is where we get the word apologetic. There, there's no defense. There's no argument you have no excuse if you have the word of God and know it and just use it for everyone else. What is that, Paul? What is it that brings you into this realm of no excuse? Well, he says, every one of you who passes judgment, this is what's called a present active participle. You just continuously are judging others. This is who you are. This is, you just go around with this negative spirit critical that's just always judging everyone else. It's a pattern. I can smell it when you walk in the church. It just, it's, it reeks. It's just, it's just who you are. Present tense, my character. Just judging everyone. This world is so bad. <laughs> Wish they were as good as me. <clears throat> he says, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, hear these words, practice the same things. Please hear this. You're judging the Gentiles, the Romans one people. You're condemning them for their behavior, which shows that you know the law of God and you're doing the same things. The problem is not judging according to God's law as it was when I read Matthew 7. There was a way to judge and do it rightly. There's no problem with Romans 1, 18 through 32 calling out sin and its need to be repented of and saved. It's righteous. It's right. The word of God's true. We should not give hearty approval to such behavior. Romans 1 is wrong. We're faithful to proclaim the truth because there's a gospel for those in that place. Not to judge them. Here's the truth so you can get to Jesus and be saved. The problem in our text is not your judging. Your problem is your judging isn't going far enough. You're doing a good job of looking at the law and, and seeing sin. You're just stopping from bringing it to your own heart. It stops before it gets to you. You're great at understanding the law. You're great expositors. You're reading mankind exactly right. It is sin against God. But you're just stopping a little bit short. But because I know the law and condemn everyone else, I'm okay. Your rightness with God is based on your condemning those that are not right with them. And you've just become this little pious, self-righteous person who just feels like you're right because everybody else isn't. And you're doing the same things. What's the purpose of the epistle? To bring glory to God. And Paul said, by the obedience of faith. I want to bring about people who believe this gospel and now go love the people of Romans 1 and 2 and have dealt with their own sin and their own hearts and they love now. This isn't happening in Romans 2. They, they stopped short of the gospel. They ended in self-righteousness. God gave a law and they pursued after it, trying to climb up the ladder with their own moral, their own righteous ways to God. And I just want you to hear this. That's the opposite of the gospel of this Bible, the gospel of God. That's not how you get there. You come with all of your righteousness stripped away. This bunch has a keen eye for the failings of others. But that does not make us right with a holy God. To see it in everyone else and to stand hard against it does not save us. We love justice. We love when it's rightfully put upon the unrighteous and say, amen. I have a friend who was a prosecuting attorney. And he said, people were so 
happy when I prosecuted hoodlums and vandals. They'd be like, good job, good job. What, what a great lawyer. They'd applaud it. They'd say, well done, until it was their kid. <laughs> then it wasn't so well done. Your judging shows that you know the truth. You have God's standard. You desire that other people live up to it but you won't apply it to yourself. You won't live it. You won't judge yourself the same way. Paul says you condemn yourself because you show that you know the truth, that you're living according to. You think that judging others somehow makes you okay. Well, you're not okay and I'm not okay is the message. There's your boomerang. Keep judging everybody. Boom. It just proves that you know the truth and you're not living according to it. Guys, judging others and condemning sin in this world does not rescue you from the wrath of God. Please hear that, religious one, this morning. Don't rest in that. Don't, don't stop in Romans 2. I got some of you who are stuck in Romans 2 and you've never moved on to the rest of the beauties of Romans and the freedom that comes to the children of God. In Luke 18, 9, Jesus told a parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. That's Romans chapter two. Is that your mugshot? You've had a lot of time to sit alone. And I want you to look and say, is, is that my mugshot? Have I stopped in Romans two? And now with a threat of a virus that could kill me or lose my job, there's nothing there. And all my critical judging everybody else isn't holding me up. And what I want to give you is a gospel that can hold you up and can take you from that. It's, just, it's, a, it's a gross spirit. I lived in it. And it makes you miserable. And you quit sharing the gospel because you're like, come be miserable with me. And I want you to come out of this miserable Romans 2 that just sits around judging everybody else and not dealing with your own heart and letting Christ have it, rule it, and save it. That's your first point. Woo. Knowledge of the truth. Second point we're going to look at is God's justice in verse 2. <clears throat> and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. This, this word day at the beginning in the Greek, is it, it means, to, let me explain this point a little further. And so we all know that this judgment then rightly, rightly, the judgment of God is right and just. Uh, Romans 1, 32, we, we know this, that it, it rightly falls on those. And verse 2, they, they know this. Uh, Psalm 98, 9, before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth and he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Psalm 119, righteous are thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. God's justice can only do what is right. He can, his judgment is perfect and pure and right. And so he says, we all know then, we know this in verse two, that the judgment of God is going to be right when it falls upon hypocrites. His judgment will be righteous. It'll be done in truth. It'll be done with perfect knowledge. Hebrews 4, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we're going to have to give an account on the last day. The song that Thomas sang, he's the judge of the secrets of the heart. You're, you're not hiding anything from perfect knowledge. God sees it all. It will all come to that day. It's going to be right. God's not fooled by appearance. The externals of religion and morality, putting on the little religious face on Sundays and all of these things. I just want you to hear it. it God sees right through that mask. All that fakeness doesn't work to smile and hug everybody and get in the car and scream at your wife and your kids. It just, it's, a, it's just gonna be burned up in truth. Quit, quit faking it. It's, it's a, just before God, it's all gonna be opened up. Your fig leaf... <laughs> like Adam had, will not stay off the piercing eye of God right into your heart and into your life and into the hidden places. 
That same brother of mine who was a lawyer, he said that a lot of the guys, when they would be in big trouble, they would come to the, to the judge and they, all these guys, he said, you wouldn't believe what they looked like when they were arrested. And now when they come before the judge, they're wearing suits, their hair's combed. He said, they look perfect to try to put on this impression so the judge will go easy on them. You're not going to be able to, your false appearances are not going to work when you stand before God. God's not going to be impressed with all the verses that you memorized that you told everyone else how to live the Christian life. All the privilege that you had of Abraham and Moses and circumcision and temple and scriptures, Messiah came from your line, that none of that's going to matter. What's going to matter is the obedience of faith. But I believe this gospel and it turned me into a lover of God and a lover to others. That's what's going to matter. Our only hope on the last day is to stand in what Christ has done for us. And this is being suppressed with self-righteousness. And I've been a minister long enough that one of the favorite tools in the church is to suppress God with self-righteousness. I don't want to deal with God. I'm a good person. I'm, I'm nice. I do all these things. And you just keep God away. And so what I'm asking this morning is quit suppressing God with self-righteousness and judging everyone else. And open up your heart before this God. And the point is simply this. You know the truth through special revelation and through general revelation. The creation tells you and the word of God tells you. And all you're doing is using it to judge the Gentiles. And God will judge in perfect righteousness. And no matter how much you preach and teach and tell others of their sin and tell them uh, what is righteous, you're going to be judged rightly. Not by what you say, but by what you do. God's not impartial. It doesn't matter that you grew up in a Christian home. He's not impartial. And this, this word says it's going to fall on you rightly. The knowledge of God, the justice of God, and then thirdly, hypocritical thinking. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? The way the Greek is designed here, it demands a no answer. Of course not. Do you suppose, the Greek word means to calculate or logic. Do you kind of reason in your mind and think that you're going to escape? It's a future tense, the judgment of God, not the judgment of Romans 1 where God gives you over. This is the judgment seat of standing before God. And so do you really think when you come before God on that last day in judgment that, that he's just going to be happy because you told everybody else how wrong they were? What breaks my heart is yes. <laughs> there are many who suppose this. They're just happy with external religion, with learning. I just got notebook after notebook and theology after theology book. I, I'm so happy with all that. And I just keep condemning everyone else who doesn't live according to this word or, or even my own standards. And day by day, I live under the dominion of sin. And the gospel has never set me free. For I genuinely love God and other people. The gospel is the most freeing thing from the bondage of sin. And, and you have none of that. You're mean-spirited and crotchety. And you're just growing in it as you get older. You've never been born again. You don't have a fervent love for God and people. A stretching love. And maybe quarantine has opened your heart up to just show you what, what's really in it while you're all locked up. Can't play your externals at church anymore. Who am I and what am I for God? So many really believe that they have an out because they're in with God. Privilege and judging other people. So judgment will never come upon me. I would that no one hearing this sermon this morning would face the day of judgment without getting to the gospel of Romans 3 where Christ hung on a cross and died for the sin of hypocrisy and judging. 
Guys, there's a remedy for this horrible sin that dwells in our hearts. There's, there's a way to get out of Romans 2. There's a way to get out of Romans 1. Some of you lived in it and God brought you out. And I, I was in Romans 2 and God brought me out. And so I just want you to see, there, Paul isn't doing this to just make you miserable and dunk you, but he's doing it so when you come up, you'll behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and be saved. I'm not ashamed of this gospel for it's the power of God to bring men, women, and children into the realm of salvation with God. I would that no one would come short without getting this. So let's look at our last point then, the kindness of God. We've looked at his knowledge, his justice, our hypocritical thinking. And now this this verse has taken my heart for so many years. The kindness of God in verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Do you think lightly? Again, present active indicative. Do you just think lightly as a, a way of life of this kindness and mercy and patience of God? The Greek word means to despise or think nothing of, to just think down upon it. This gospel, just not much. Don't think about it. God's so patient with me. You think lightly of the riches of his kindness. This word for riches means abundance, great amount, extreme value. Do you think lightly of the riches of God and what he's given and poured out in Christ Jesus. They're thinking down on the abundant supply of God's beneficence. You're despising his goodness and his kindness and his generosity. Moses said, show me your glory. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed in front of him and and proclaimed, here's his glory. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands and forgives your iniquity and transgression and sin. Yet he'll by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So he's saying, do you think lightly of his kindness? This God, Israel, he he took you out of slavery with an outstretched hand. He took you to be his people. He provided and protected for you, Israelites. He brought you into a land flowing with milk and honey. He gave you a system to worship him. He he called you, he gave you commandments so you could obey him. Are you despising his kindness? Are you presuming upon all these things in history that God's given you as privilege? The privilege became their pass to heaven. I was born into a Christian home. My my parents were religious. My grandparents were religious. And you just think all this privilege that you got living in America where you were taught God, used to be taught God even in schools. And just all that privilege makes me okay. I'm not going to be judged because of all that. The rabbis taught Abraham stands at the gates of hell to make sure that no Jew will ever go in. All that privilege and kindness It's not so that you would continue in sin, but that it would lead you to repentance. The kindness of God was never so you could just keep sinning and think God doesn't care about it. It was to bring repentance. How could I sin against a God who delivered me with his outstretched hand from the slavery of Egypt? How could I just look at that deliverance and just live in sin and act like it's think lightly? about that. And how much more the religious of our day, who now we have the New Testament, and we get to see all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. We got to see the Son of God come into this world and die on a cross to save us. He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And he died on a tree for our sins. We can argue and debate about the atonement. 
but we won't believe in it and rest in it and treasure it as our greatest treasure. That's where Romans 2, that's how you get out of it. It's the kindness of God and what his son did on a cross. You just don't look at that and say, let me be mean, gnarly, and nasty to the world and just judge everyone and be mean-spirited. Let the kindness of God in Christ Jesus lead you to repentance this morning. As the cross of Christ brought you to poverty of spirit, where you look and say, there's nothing I can do to get myself out of Romans 1 or Romans 2. I can't change my nature. I can't change my, my record. My only hope is if God, through Christ Jesus, you will deliver me and bring me out of my sin and my bondage. Repentance and faith. Paul in Galatians said, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If I can get right with God by keeping law and judging everyone else, then why would Jesus Christ hang on a cross? He hung on the cross because there was no other way for us to be saved. By hanging on that cross, there's now a savior from immorality and morality, from being irreligious and being religious. There's a savior who can bring us to God and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So in conclusion... Are you one who has had so much privilege? You've had the word of God your whole life. And you can teach it and preach it. You even teach in our Sunday schools. You're one of our pastors. You call others to repentance and to a godly life. While you live the exact same way. Have you let your dealing with and judging the sins of others let your heart think you're okay by that while you live the same way. Hold up the light of God and let it shine in your heart this morning. Spurgeon said he, he had a candle, but he did not place it on the table to light his own room. He held it out the front door to inspect there with his neighbor who passed by. So I have my little candle and all I'm using the light of God's word is to judge everyone else and I never took it and held it up to my own heart. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. Is to let the word of God shine right into your own heart. Has the kindness and tolerance and patience of God led you to believe that what you're doing is okay and made you numb and not repent? Have you suppressed God by keeping rules and doing all the right things without being in a right relationship with him? My little children in this church... Little kids, if you're still listening, it's been a long-winded sermon and I apologize, but if you've been in a Christian family your whole life, has that become your savior? Or have you looked to Jesus Christ to save you from your sins? Guys, do we condemn the world and, and see, do you see in your own heart a need for a savior? Have you moved from Romans 2 to Romans 3 be silenced and accountable before God and poor in spirit that there's nothing you can do to save yourself. And right now, in Romans 1, the righteousness of God is being revealed. It's being manifested that Jesus Christ has come to die for our sins and live the, the, what the law required. He perfectly fulfilled it. Perfect righteousness is being offered to you by grace through faith. And I can look away from all my immoralities or all my judging and using the law for everyone else and the quietness of my heart, I can look right now and receive the righteousness of God and Jesus Christ by faith. To believe it with my heart before God this very hour. He's a savior for Romans 1 people and Romans 2. He will save all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from self-righteousness to Christ's righteousness by faith. Let's pray. Father, these are hard words, but necessary. And I pray now that by your spirit, you would cut off the flesh that has overgrown our hearts. You've gotten us isolated and alone to look at them and see what's there, to see how we deal with the threat of death and and losing jobs and all the fears that come with this. 
God, I pray, let us look at our hearts before you with the light. Let us hold the candle up to our own hearts. Quit holding it out to say, oh, now the world will repent. God, I pray that we will repent. I pray that we will look at our own hypocrisy this morning and come to the one with no hypocrisy. God, there's a righteousness that we can receive as beggars and those whose righteousness is broken. It's a filthy rag. We see it. And you will give us the righteous garment of Jesus Christ. Oh God, I pray for that. Do your work at Southside Bible Church. God, use this time of isolation for us to deal with these sins. And God, I pray for any who have tuned in and labored through a long, hard season. Instead of something easy and cheap and simple, they fought to understand what your word says. God, would you give them the prize, the prize of salvation in Jesus Christ by faith alone. Let them in all the brokenness over sin or their own righteousness. That's a filthy rag this morning. God, let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will save. God, do your mighty work, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.